let's continue to talk about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination, but this time let's focus on some causes of these problems. We'll talk about social categorization and intergroup conflict. Let's talk about social categorization first. As we lead into that issue, it's important to understand that stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination are sometimes natural byproducts of human thought and behavior. I know that sounds horrible, but we aren't perfect people. We aren't perfect electrochemical machines. In an effort to be brutally efficient, and our bodies are pretty darn efficient, our minds are pretty darn efficient. Well, in that effort to be efficient, our minds and our bodies sometimes lead us into trouble. And social categorization would be a prime example for that. Social categorization is simply a process of categorizing or classifying people into groups. And those groups are usually based on some common attribute that the people share. So it might be something like gender. Of course, we can very easily group people into women and men. Race, age, location, meaning like where you're from or where you live now. It's pretty easy to classify people as northerners or southerners, for example. Even within the same town, maybe you were born on the wrong side of the tracks and you know that you've been classified in that way ever since you were born. That would just be an example of social categorization. Now, it's a relatively complex thing, and the way we classify people can change based on circumstances. So imagine a situation like this. If two women meet each other, and they're talking, and they're trying to make sense of each other, Beth might be a homemaker, and let's say Amy is a business executive. Even though they're both women, they might be classifying each other in this situation as very different types of people um, because of the roles that they have in society. But imagine if you put those ladies together with some men, it's more likely now that they're gonna recategorize each other as members of the same group, women and men. Now keep this in mind too, this categorization process is really natural and it's adaptive. In general, it's a good thing. It's just that it's got some side effects that can cause trouble. It serves an organizational purpose. And if it does serve an organizational purpose, it typically saves us some time and some mental energy. Let's talk about that in just a little bit more detail. We naturally want to organize things because it allows us to simplify things. And that's what categorization is all about. It helps us better understand the social environment when we can place things in categories. I mentioned that this categorization process allows us to save time and cognitive resources. And that's because if we can classify people, we don't need to reanalyze people every time we encounter them, when we encounter similar types of people. And this, by the way, is where we do run into some types of problems. So for example, I can categorize students in a particular way because I've met lots of students. So in general, I might see students as sharing some similar traits. They tend to be pretty eager. They tend to be energetic. They're optimistic. They're looking forward to their future careers. Those would be some positive attributes that they share. There are some negative attributes as well. They tend to be overworked. And because they're overworked, they're not always completing assignments on time or up to my expectations. Um, sometimes they're sleep deprived. Do you see how these are common attributes? So I might not have even met you, a student, but I still think at least that I know a lot about you. That's what social categorization is all about. That's how it's saving me time and resources. I don't need to rebuild you from the bottom up without already knowing quite a bit about you. I mentioned that the social categorization process is adaptive. And if we look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, we can see that it is. So for example, people who have categorized others well, situations well, other animals well, people who use the categorization process effectively have been more likely to survive and thrive and then pass on their genes to us. So let me just give you an example. Think about people classifying dogs. So let's say someone classifies pit bulls as dangerous and a type of dog that they should avoid. Well, those people are now less likely to be harmed and more likely to survive. Now, it's also possible, of course, that there might have been some very sweet pit bulls that they judged unfairly. And now you see another example of the categorization process going awry. By classifying people, we do indeed save cognitive resources. Sometimes it could be adaptive. But by classifying people and animals and things, we stereotype those people and animals and things, and we know some of the problems that we run into once we start stereotyping people. That leads to discrimination, negative attitudes, a variety of things like that. 
So now think about how that same process could work when people encounter young black men. If they have perceived young black men to be potentially violent, then people who harbor that stereotype will be more likely to avoid them and discriminate against them when making maybe hiring decisions or housing decisions or dating decisions, things like that. Now, of course, there's a flip side to that as well. Not all stereotypes include completely negative behavior. Some black men are also perceived to be athletic. And in these cases, social categorization might lead to preferential treatment, for example, by a coach when there's a big game coming up and the coach need to, needs to decide who's going to play in that game and who's going to ride the bench. Even though the social categorization process is normal, it is potentially destructive. Different groups of people, whether we're talking about men and women or blacks and whites, are much more similar than we think. And of course, the flip side of that is true. You know, not all men are alike, for example. But social categorization leads to a tendency for us to overestimate differences between groups and to underestimate differences within groups. And that can lead to stereotypic beliefs and various biases, which we'll discuss on the next slide, and uh, discrimination, of course. See, here's another problem. We naturally want to rank categories once we make those categories in terms of which are best. And it's probably not surprising that our group is often seen as best. Although this might lead to increased self-esteem in some situations, like when our group is performing really well and we can bask in their glory, it can also lead to social unrest because favoring our own group undermines social cooperation. We also have this tendency to perceive group differences as inborn and unalterable. So for example, there might be some people who are thinking you're black. They might have a stereotypic belief that blacks are violent. So they're thinking you'll always be black. You'll always be violent. That's not going to change. That tends to go along with social categorization. Again, that people tend to perceive that these group differences are inborn and unalterable. So another example, um, people might think like uh, you're a Jew. Uh, you'll always be a Jew. Jews are cheap and selfish and immoral, and that's not going to change. Again, there's this tendency to perceive groups as having traits that are inborn and unalterable. So that's clearly a problem. Well, I mentioned that we tend to favor our own group, and that leads us to a discussion of in-groups versus out-groups. Let's talk about that next. The social categorization process does indeed lead us to divide people into in-groups and out-groups, these two broad categories. In-groups are simply groups that we identify with. So we share some type of characteristics. Perhaps it's our gender or our religion or our hometown, and we feel that we are members of that group. Out-groups would be the opposite. So we don't feel that we identify with that group and we don't feel that we're members. They're outsiders in a sense. And I think this comic sums that up pretty well Imagine a pep rally. You got the cheerleader saying, Lakeview High is the best. And the crowd, of course, is cheering. Yeah, you know, they're all right along with that. And they often tend to uh, add to that. And our opponent, Ocean View High, sucks. So what we're seeing there are clear examples of in-group favoritism and out-group denigration. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the point that I'm trying to make is that the social categorization process between in-groups and out-groups has consequences for the way that we think and for the way that we see other people. One thing it leads to is an us versus them mentality. And of course, that tends to not be consistent with social harmony. That tends to not be consistent with social cooperation. And we know in general, when human beings cooperate, they tend to be much more successful. So an us versus them mentality undermines success. You've probably noticed this in your own life. You've probably noticed that you favor your own family over others. You've probably noticed that you favor your friends over others. That's in-group favoritism. Now, out-group denigration often goes along with that. And we tend to uh, attribute negative traits to members of groups that we don't align ourselves with. In the laboratory, this is studied in a very interesting way. And keep in mind, what the researchers want to do is they want to create on their own these new groups. On their own, they want to create in-groups and out-groups. And the way they do that is through the most minimal type of way. And in fact, this is called the minimal group paradigm. So for example, as the subjects come into the lab, 
they might ask them to look at a slide that shows a variety of dots and they'll show it to them very quickly. So right now, look at that and estimate the number of dots that you see. So then it's going to go away. And it's likely that you will not be completely accurate. And you're either going to overestimate the dots or underestimate the dots. And now the researchers might go into a little bit of an explanation about how some people are overestimators and some people are underestimators. It might provide a couple qualities that those people have. And now you're a part of one of those groups and other people are a part of the other group. So right there in the lab, they've created an in-group and an out-group. And later on, those groups need to interact and they need to engage in some tasks. And sometimes those tasks involved allocating resources and the group members can allocate the resources like the points or the coins or whatever it might be in any way that they want. And what's typically found is that group members show favoritism and they allocate more points, more resources to members of their own group, even though that group has, has very little to do with anything about them as a person. So it's interesting that these minimal groups show a bias toward their own group, even though there's very little that actually makes them a group. And it's not like they have any past history with the out group. There's no reason for them to dislike the out group. It's not like they've ever been at odds with the out group. So even when these groups are created based on very minimalistic types of criteria, we're able to find in the lab these types of issues in group favoritism and out group denigration. So it's a really very powerful demonstration of in group bias. It's important to understand that we also process information about outgroups differently. So for example, one thing that we notice is something called outgroup homogeneity. And we tend to notice more subtle differences about members of our in-group, while at the same time, we tend not to see those subtle differences when we look at members of the outgroup. We tend to see them as much more similar, almost as if they were all the same or like they all look alike. And those are typically seen as relatively racist comments. That outgroup homogeneity can lead to what we call a cross-race identification bias. And the whole idea is that, in general, we are less accurate at distinguishing subtle differences between faces of, of racial groups, outgroups. And this has led to some pretty nasty consequences, like wrongful convictions after eyewitnesses from one race have incorrectly identified innocent suspects from another race. Let me give you an example of that. In 1984, Jennifer Thompson was raped she was raped by Bobby Poole. He's pictured right there. Now, unfortunately, she picked Ronald Cotton from a lineup. She said during trial that she was 100% certain that Cotton is the person who raped her. He, of course, was convicted, and he spent more than a decade in prison. Eventually, he got out, and everybody came to know who the real rapist was via DNA evidence. And it's really more common than you think. This particular case gets a lot of press because Thompson and Cotton speak publicly about this issue. They're friends now. So why does something like this happen? Why is it that members of one group tend to see their own group in very specific ways, but they tend not to notice those subtle differences with members of an out group? Well, one factor has to do with familiarity. Um, people of one group of one race often just don't interact a lot with people of another group of another race. So they don't have as much experience with them. Another thing has to do with um, having information that is non-representative of that group. So if in the news I see information about blacks that often has to do with violent crime, and if I live in a situation where I don't interact with the black community very often, that might be the only information that I have. So when we're talking about outgroup homogeneity and kind of seeing them as all alike or sharing similar attributes, that might simply be because I have very little experience with them demonstrating other attributes. Now, I mentioned that the social categorization process influences the way we process information about outgroups. This can also lead to outgroup dehumanization. People often see outgroups as being less capable of complex human emotion, the things that we see as uniquely human, like love, remorse, mourning, I have to say that I'm guilty of this too. Oftentimes when I'm watching the news and I see on the other side of the world some type of bombing and there's death and there's destruction and I see mothers and wives crying, I'm often looking at them thinking like, wow, it's so interesting that they're showing the same emotion that I would be showing 
And of course they would. Why would I, why would I find that interesting? Well, again, it's because we have this natural tendency to look at an outgroup and to see them as different and to see them as less capable of the things that we are capable of. Now, of course, I can recognize that and kind of correct that in myself. But in some extreme situations, outgroups can also be seen as simply less human, where their lives are, are less valued overall. Think back to the days of the Second World War and the events leading up to the Holocaust. Of course, the goal was to exterminate an entire group of people. Well, it's hard to exterminate people. But there were campaigns underway to help people view Jews as something other than human. So here you can see Jews were depicted as uh, almost some type of monster. Here Jews were seen as essentially akin to animals. In this picture you see a Jew depicted as a rat, as a rodent. Now of course if we are viewing Jews as non-human, it's a little bit easier to treat innocent women in this way, starve them, hold them hostage. If we're seeing Jews as something other than human, it's a little bit easier to treat innocent children this way, starve them, hold them hostage. And of course, of course, if people can come to treating innocent women and innocent children this way, just think of how horrible they might treat the husbands and the fathers. So it's important to understand here that outgroup dehumanization has had a role in many atrocities throughout human history. So I hope that you're learning some important life lessons from some of the stuff that we're talking about in this class. That's it for this section, but stay tuned. There's more social psychology coming up soon.